Assalamu alaikum everybody. Today we'll be looking at Vibrio Colliery in detail. Thankfully, Picmonic is sponsoring today's video. Picmonic is an audio-visual learning platform that is tailored to assess the needs of medical students. Picmonic provides valuable resources for medical students, like video lectures, visual mnemonics, quizzes, study scheduler, and more. I'll be reviewing Vibrio Colliery from Picmonic at the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. And also, if you guys are interested in signing up on Picmonic, I've got you a discount code MEDZOHROV and the link in the description that will give you 20% off on your purchase. So what are you waiting for? Go sign up and have fun learning. Vibrio Colliery. It's a gram-negative rod. It's a facultative anaerobe, which means it can live both in the presence and absence of oxygen. It's a flagellated bacterium. Flagella is a motility apparatus. It's a hair-like structure, this one. And Vibrio Colliery has that one at its one pole, which helps this bacterium to move. So, Vibrio Colliery is motile bacterium. It produces cholera toxin or choleragen toxin. We'll talk about that toxin in detail later in today's video. Vibrio Colliery is a part of Vibronaceae family. It is responsible for causing cholera which is a watery diarrhea disease. It is oxidase positive. It is non-lactose fermenter. But you know what? It ferments glucose. That's why it's glucose fermenter. It grows in alkaline environments. Not just grows, it thrives in alkaline environments. Vibrio colliery is divided into serogroups according to the nature of O cell wall antigen into O1, O139 and non O1. But before talking about Vibrio colliery in detail, let us talk about the classification of bacteria. Bacteria are further classified into spirochetes and also into acid-fast bacteria based on acid-fast staining. And there's an exception, that's the mycoplasma bacterium. And bacteria are also subdivided based on gram staining into gram-positive. We're done with all of these bacteria. If you guys are interested, be sure to check out the channel and also into gram-negative. Gram-negative bacteria are further subclassified into cocci, that includes Neisseria, the Neisseria gonorrhoeae, and Neisseria meningitidis, and also into rods, which are further subdivided into aerobic, like pseudomonas, anaerobic, like bacteroids, and facultative. Facultative are further subdivided into curved, which includes Campylobacter, Helicobacter, and Vibrio cholerae, the topic of today's video and also into straight ones, which include respiratory, like Haemophilus, Bordetella, Legionella, also zoonotic, like Brucella, Francisella, Pastorella, and Yersinia, and into enteric and related, which include E. coli, Enterobacter, Theresia, Klebsiella, Salmonella, Shigella, and Proteus. But that's not all. Gram-negative bacteria are also classified based on their shapes like diplococci, cocobacilli, rods, and comma-shaped. Diplococci are further subdivided based on maltose fermentation. If a bacteria ferments maltose, it's Neisseria meningitidis, and if it doesn't, it's Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Cocobacilli include Haemophilus influenza, Brucella, Pasteurella, Bordetella pertussis. Rods are further subdivided based on lactose fermentation. If bacteria ferments lactose, it's going to be fast or slow fermenter. Fast ones include Clapsiella, E. coli, and Enterobacter, and slow ones include Serratia and others. And if bacteria do not ferment lactose, they are further subdivided based on oxidase tests. If a bacterium comes to be oxidase positive, it's Pseudomonas. And if bacteria come to be oxidase negative, they are Shigella, Salmonella, Proteus, and Yersinia. Comma-shaped bacteria are further subdivided based on certain criteria. If a bacteria produces urease, it's going to be H. pylori. If it grows in 42 degrees Celsius temperature, it's going to be Campylobacter gigini. And if it grows in alkaline media, it's going to be Vibrio cholerae. Vibrios include different species, but the ones we are concerned with are Vibrio cholerae, Vibrio parahemolyticus and Vibrio vulnificus. Lecture outline. We are done with the introduction and classification. Now we'll be looking at morphology, habitat in transmission, risk factors, pathogenesis, clinical findings, 
lab diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and at the end, as usual, we'll review the lecture. Morphology. Vibrios are curved, comma-shaped, and gram-negative rods, as you can see in this microscopic picture. It varies in size from 1 to 3 micrometers by 0.5 to 0.8 micrometer. It's pink-colored bacterium. The reason is it's gram-negative. Structure. It's an encapsulated bacterium. It also has a cell wall. We talked about the O cell wall antigen in the introduction, if you remember. It is not responsible for producing spores. It is motile. The reason is it has got a flagella at its one pole. It has several pili all over its body, which helps it to attach to the different host surfaces. It also produces an enterotoxin. That's the cholera toxin, the cholera agent. This is how Vibrio cholerae looks like under the microscope. Comma-shaped, rod, curved bacterium with a flagella and it's pink colored. The reason is it's gram negative. As we've discussed earlier, that Vibrio cholerae is divided into zero groups according to the nature of its O cell wall antigen into O1, O139, and non O1. O1 and O139 are pathogenic and they're responsible for causing cholera. And non O1 is either non pathogenic or if it causes a disease, it will be sporadic disease. Um, the O1 organisms have two biotypes called classic and E1 TOA, and three serotypes called Ogawa, Inaba, and Hykojima. Biotypes are based on differences in biochemical reactions, whereas serotypes are based on antigenic differences. These features are used to characterize isolate and epidemiologic investigations. Zero group O139 organisms, which caused a major epidemic in 1992, are identified by their reaction to antisera to the O139 polysaccharide antigens, O antigen. Habitat, hosts. Human beings are the hosts of Vibrio cholerae. The reason is it causes infections in the small intestine. The main animal reservoirs are marine shellfish, such as shrimp and oysters, and Vibrio cholerae is also found in brackish or salt water. Transmission Vibrio cholerae is transmitted by fecal contamination of water and food, and also by eating undercooked or raw marine food. Risk factors The factors that predispose to epidemics. Don't worry, we'll talk about the cholera epidemic in just a moment. These factors are poor sanitation, malnutrition, overcrowding, inadequate medical services. And you know what? Vibrio cholerae is particularly sensitive to stomach acid. So people with little or no stomach acid, such as those taking antacids or those who have had gastrectomy, are much more susceptible to developing cholera. A major epidemic of cholera, which spanned the 1960s and 1970s, began in Southeast Asia and spread over three continents to the areas of Africa, Europe, and rest of Asia. Another epidemic of cholera began in Peru in 1991 and has spread to many countries in Central and South America. The organism isolated most frequently was the O1 tor biotype of O1 vibrio cholerae, usually of Ogawa serotype. Quarantine measures failed to prevent the spread of this disease because there were many asymptomatic carriers. In 1992, Vibrio cholerae serogroup 0139 emerged and caused a widespread epidemic of cholera in India and Bangladesh. Pathogenesis It has got four steps. First one is colonization and the second one is secretion of enterotoxin. Pathogenesis of cholera is dependent on these two steps. Third one is action of enterotoxin and the last one is appearance of symptoms. Let's start with colonization. For colonization to occur, large numbers of bacteria must be ingested because the organism is particularly sensitive to stomach acid. Adherence to the cells of the brush border of the gut, which is a requirement for colonization, is related to secretion of bacterial enzyme mucinase which dissolves the protective glycoprotein coating over the intestinal cells, as you can see there. Step number two, secretion of enterotoxin. After adhering, the organism multiplies and secretes an enterotoxin. 
cholera toxin or choleragin. A really high yield thing about this toxin is that it can reproduce the symptoms of cholera even in the absence of vibrio organisms. Step number three, it's the action of enterotoxin. We're going to talk about the cholera toxin in detail. Choleragin consists of an A, active subunit, and B, binding subunit. The B subunit, which is a pentema, the word pent is used for five, it is composed of five identical proteins. And this B subunit binds to a ganglioside receptor on the surface of the enterocyte. The A subunit, on the other hand, is inserted into the cytosol where it catalyzes the addition of ADP ribose to the GS protein, this one. GS is the stimulatory G protein. This locks the GS protein in the on position, which causes the persistent stimulation of adenylate cyclase, this one. This results in overproduction of cyclic AMP, which activates the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase. That's an enzyme that phosphorylates ion transporters in cell membrane. This results in loss of water and ions from the cell. Just like that. Step number four, the last step, appearance of symptoms. The watery efflux enters the lumen of gut, resulting in a massive diarrhea that contains neither neutrophils nor red blood cells. That's why it's a non-bloody diarrhea. Morbidity and death are due to dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Now let's talk about the genes for cholera and other virulence factors. These genes are carried on a single-stranded DNA bacteriophage, which is called CTX, lysogenic conversion of non-toxin-producing strains to toxin-producing ones can occur when the CTX phage transduces these genes. The pili that attach the organism to the gut mucosa are the receptors for the phage, a non o one vibrio cholerase. It is an occasional cause of diarrhea, and it is associated with eating shellfish that's obtained from coastal waters. Clinical findings. Watery diarrhea in large volumes is a hallmark of cholera. There are no red blood cells or white blood cells in this stool, which means that this is the non-bloody diarrhea. Rice water stool is a term that is often applied to non-bloody effluent because the stool in cholera resembles the boiling rice water. I don't have its picture at the moment. There I've got boiled rice and there I've got rice soaked in water. This is just a visual mnemonic for you guys. There is no abdominal pain and subsequent symptoms are referable to marked dehydration. Some people may experience vomiting, leg cramps and restlessness or irritability. If cholera is left untreated, it can complicate to gastritis. The loss of fluid and electrolytes can lead to cardiac failure and renal failure. Acidosis and hyperkalemia also occur as a result of loss of bicarbonate and potassium in this tool. Shock, coma, and death can also occur. Lab diagnosis. We'll need the samples of feces, blood, rectal swab, gastric biopsy specimen. Then we'll go for gram staining. And on gram staining, vibrial cholerae comes to be gram negative because it's pink colored. And under microscopy, it appears as curved, comma-shaped rod bacterium. It varies in size from 1 to 3 micrometers by 0.5 to 0.8 micrometer. It is pink colored. This is how it looks like under the microscope. It's gram-negative, it's curved, comma-shaped bacterium, it's rod. It also has a flagella right there. For diagnosis of sporadic cases, a culture of diarrheal stool containing vibrio cholerae will show colorless colonies on McConaughey's agar because lactose is fermented slowly. The organism is oxidase positive, which distinguishes it from members of Enterobacteriaceae. On TSI, triple sugar iron agar, an acid slant and an acid butt without gas or H2S is seen because the organism ferments sucrose. There I've got a culture of Vibrio cholerae, but that's on non-selective gelatin agar. There are certain other tests that are performed, like blood tests, complete blood count, 
and it is used to find out the antibodies against Fibrio cholerae. There are certain biochemical tests like oxidase test, string test and others. The most important test is PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. It confirms the diagnosis of cholera. Let's look at the string test now. It is performed on a glass microscope slide or plastic petri dish. We've got the microscopic slide there. By suspending 18 to 24 hour growth from HIA or other non-inhibitory media and a drop of 0.5% aqueous solution of sodium deoxycholate. If the result is positive, the bacterial cells will be lysed by sodium deoxycholate. The suspension will lose its turbidity and DNA will be released from the lysed cells, causing the mixture to become viscous. A mucoid string is formed when an inoculating loop is drawn slowly away from the suspension. Most vibrios show a positive string test. Treatment. We've got treatment plan there. First, we'll go for prompt rehydration therapy, then administration of antibiotic. When prompt treatment is instituted, the disease runs a self-limiting course in up to seven days. Rehydration therapy. Adequate replacement of water and electrolytes, either orally, for that we'll use ORS, the oral rehydration salt, or intravenously, for that we'll use Ringer's lactate. Glucose is added to the solution to enhance the uptake of water and electrolytes. Antibiotics like tetracycline and fluoroquinolones are used. Prevention. Prevention is achieved mainly by public health measures that ensure a clean water and food supply. Proper hygiene means proper hand washing can prevent the occurrence of cholera. Prompt detection of carriers is also important in limiting the outbreaks. There are certain vaccines that can also help prevent against cholera. The OCV, OCV means oral cholera vaccine, an oral live attenuated vaccine called Waxcora. There are other vaccines like Ducoral, Shankol, and Uvicol. Alright guys, let's review everything from this visual mnemonic from Picmonic. Vibrio cholera that's portrayed by this vibrating collie sitting on a sofa is a gram-negative bacillus that is shown by this gram-negative character that is holding a rod in his hand which shows that this spectrum is rod-shaped. Vibrio cholera can be distinguished from other gram-negative rods because it is glucose fermenting which is shown by this glue bottle with fern growing from it. And also Vibrio cholerae is non-lactose fermenting, which is shown by the nun that is holding the milk cotton with the dead fern. This bacterium is oxidase positive, which is shown by oxidase. The characteristic shape of cholera is comma-shaped and curved-shaped bacterium, which is shown by the comma-shaped shrimp. As we know that this bacterium thrives in alkaline environments, which is portrayed by the comma-shaped shrimp thriving in more alkaline environment according to the pH scale. Additionally, Vibrio species are classically found in seafood, particularly crustaceans that is portrayed by a vibrating collie eating the shrimp. If you guys are interested in signing up on Picmonic, I've got you a discount code that is Medzuchra and the link in the description that will give you 20% off on your purchase. So what are you waiting for? Go sign up and have fun learning. And that's it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You've learned something. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comments. And if you want to connect with me on my socials, I've got my Instagram and Twitter. And I'll catch you in the next video. Till then, assalamualaikum.